we're live. Great. Um, I think we'll give people a, a while to start filtering in as well. No worries. Can you see how many? Fine. Yeah, there's four people on at the moment. Okay. It looked like there were a few more than that. Signed up, yeah. Yeah, we'll give them, give them a few minutes. I think we'll give it until 35 and then we'll just get going and people can start trickling in. I think you're muted. Yeah, sorry, I just didn't want any background noise while we were sort of waiting for people to filter in, but I'm just sending the slides now. Um, but yeah, they're mainly pictures, so people won't be um, missing out on too much if they're not uploaded straight away. Okay, I've sent those.
Okay, perfect. So let's let's start. Um, my name is Maria. I'm the new lead for the um, ACCS sub team for Mind Bleep. Um, and I think we're going to kick off with our Day in the Life series with Dr. Olivia Bell, um, who's currently a CT2 on the ACCS anaesthetics training pathway. Um, I think she's about two months deep. Um, so she'll just really talk about her normal day to day, what training's like, um, I guess the benefits and cons of doing an ACS, ACCS training pathway. Um, but yeah, so I'll let her introduce herself further and get on with it. Great, thanks very much, Maria. Right, I'm just going to try and share my slides. Uh, give me just a second. Sorry, a little bit technologically incompetent. Um, Sorry about that, it's just... All right. Now can... Okay. Now, can everybody see the opening kind of presentation slide? Yeah. Perfect. All right. So, as Maria said, my name's Liv. I'm currently an ACCS anaesthetics CT2 in the Northern Deanery. Um, so, just start with a little bit about my, myself, just so that you kind of know roughly what kind of path I've taken and I suppose that you feel vaguely confident that I'm someone who's qualified to talk to you about this. So I went straight to medical school from school, um, went to Oxford, did a two year foundation programme in the northeast, um, which is home for me. I wanted to come home. Um, I was unfortunately a foundation doctor during the pandemic, which meant that everything was a little bit strange. Rotations got moved around. I think by the end of that, I was quite tired and wanted a break, um, but it wasn't the best time to travel. So I did a trust grade job rather than applying for training first time round. Um, that trust grade job was sort of an easy job with about 30% special interest in FEM, so pre-hospital emergency medicine. So through that, I did some shifts with the local ambulance service and organised some um, trauma first aid courses for farm and forestry workers. I applied to training this time around two years ago, um, having to think back there, um, and got in first time. Um, Northern Deanery was my first choice. Um, so when I was in the process of applying for training, there were lots of things that I was a little bit uncertain about. Um, one of them was, you know, do I want to do anaesthetics in the first place? Um, so we'll, we'll sort of move on to some of the things that I found that I really like about it. Essentially, I was torn between whether I wanted to do anaesthetics or whether I wanted to do ED. Um, and I have to say, about two weeks into starting anaesthetics, all of those sort of feelings of have I done the right thing, or they completely disappeared, which is reassuring. Um, the other thought that I had was, you know, is it worth doing ACCS or should I just try and apply for core anaesthetics? Now, in the Northeast, actually, it wasn't really that much of a consideration because most of the jobs here are for ACCS trainees but I know in some other regions there's a difference between core and ACCS so if, if at the end anybody has any questions about that or wants to talk a little bit more about pros and cons of that I'm happy to do so but I'm aware that kind of the remit of what we're doing today is mainly talking about um, experience kind of as an anaesthetic new starter and through ACCS. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what anaesthetics is like day to day, um, kind of the, I suppose the remit of what the job can entail later on as well, because it's, it's a massive specialty. It's the biggest hospital specialty and it's also really, really broad in its scope, which is why a lot of people are attracted to it. Um, I've put applications and training pathway in brackets, um, simply because, Mind the Bleep have already got an absolutely fantastic seminar uploaded online, which goes into loads of detail about that. Um, and I think focusing more on what life as a trainee is actually like in this talk might be useful just 
just sort of so that we're doing something different. Um, but I have sort of briefly included some things about that as well. Um, the bulk of the talk is going to be a day in the life. So for me, it was a day in a in an elective theatre doing a large case. Um, through sort of all of the previous points, I guess we're going to end up discussing some of the skills and competencies you can hope to get out of core anaesthetic training um, and then hopefully we should have some time for questions. Um, I realise we started a little bit late so I'll try and be quick so that if anybody does have any questions you've got plenty of time for it. Um, so again already touched on this a little bit but anaesthetics is an absolutely enormous specialty. Um, personally as a medical student I didn't have an enormous amount of exposure to it until I sorted out um, as an SSC. Um, so what I was exposed to in medical school essentially was, you know, sometimes floating up to the head and having a chat to the anaesthetist when I was getting a little bit bored in general surgery. Um, but actually, you know, that, that sort of elective theatre side of things is just one very small part of what an anaesthetist does. So the responsibilities that you can take on later on kind of throughout your training but also as a consultant are massive um you know I've listed some of them here but it's something where actually there's a lot of scope to kind of sub-specialize and actually change up your job plan later on so anesthetists overall tend to be pretty happy and um, they tend not to get bored and they tend to have relatively more control over their lives than some of the other consultants I've met, which is nice. Um, so some of the things that I was considering when I was trying to figure out whether this was something that I wanted to do um, were some of the things I've got listed here. So what I've got here essentially are a list of things that I probably would consider to be pros of anaesthetics, um, which hopefully a lot of them I'll demonstrate to you while talking through my day as a trainee. Um, you know, one-on-one -on -one consultant teaching. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but as a foundation doctor, particularly during the pandemic, teaching sort of disappeared and we were kind of just left to get on with it. And actually being back in an environment where we're not really expected to know that much in the beginning. And most, most if not all of the time that we're spending at the moment is one-on-one -on -one with consultants. Um, so during that time, yes you're looking after patients and things but there's times sort of during the case where actually you can use it sort of as a tutorial really you know if you wanted to you could go in on a certain day and say actually today I want to learn about ventilators and the consultant would just talk to you about ventilators um so it's it, it's it's really really good from a sort of learning point of view which is something that I was probably beginning to <laughs> was beginning to think didn't really exist in kind of the post-grad medic world before I started this. Um, again, procedural skills absolutely loads every patient that you've got that, you, you know, you're at least going to be cannulating them. You're going to be probably intubating, you know, otherwise you'd be putting in an eye gel. Larger cases, there are art lines, central lines, spinals, regional anaesthetics, things like that. Um, speaking to a lot of the consultants who I've worked with in anaesthetics and in other specialties. It seems like anaesthetics is one of the specialties where the job that you start doing as a trainee and the job that you end up doing as a consultant are the most similar. Um, you know, obviously the consultants have a vast amount more knowledge than we do as very junior trainees, but they're doing the same type of thing, just on a sort of bigger and more complex scale, um, which is quite nice. And I think it you know, it seems that it's stopped them from kind of getting as disillusioned as maybe some consultants and other specialties. Um, you know, I think I'm not going to list all of these things, but I, I suppose my point is it's very, very, <laughs> it's, it's very different to a lot of the other specialties that you're exposed to as foundation doctors and during your time at medical school and if it's something you're interested in um, these are what I would see as the pros but I would definitely try and just get a little bit of exposure to see if it's something that is for you you know even a taste a week as an F2 or a taste a couple of days if that's what you can manage or 
you know, trying to get onto sort of resource and simulation courses and things like that, and actually just having a chat to um, trainees who've been through it. So if you don't know any anaesthetists or don't know kind of even how you'd get to speak to one, speak to your a &E, Reg, because they've done an ACCS CT2 year and they've done six months of anaesthetics and they'll be able to give you at least a little bit of insight on what that's like. Fine. Um, so applications, I'm not really going to go into too much detail about this. Just I suppose my main pieces of advice really would be make sure that you very thoroughly read the person's specification. Um, and if you are lucky enough to get um, to MSRA, make sure you prepare for it. Um, there are plenty of resources available online. And likewise, for interview, there are lots of really helpful resources online. I'm sorry if any of you were hoping to hear a little bit more about that from this talk, but there is a previous Mind the Bleep seminar which goes into all of this stuff in really great detail, um, which I've linked at the end of my presentation. Um, so hopefully that'll be really helpful for you. Um, so the training pathway. Now, I've just put this slide in here just to make you guys aware um, that the shape of anaesthetic training has changed in the last couple of years. So there was a new curriculum um, introduced in 2021, which essentially changed um, changed where the gap between SHO and registrar training was. So now for core anaesthetic training, you do a CT1, 2 and 3 year, or if you're an ACCS trainee, then it's 1, 2, 3 and 4, with 2, 3 and 4 being your anaesthetic years. Um, the reason for that was largely to help with the fact that a lot of trainees were struggling to get through the exams on time. So it just sort of gives a little bit more wiggle room there. Um, but again, the um, curriculum has been restructured. That was something I was asked about in my interview. So just if you do get to that point, just be aware um, and have a little look into it. Um, again, rather than having sort of specific sign offs, a lot of the things in the curriculum have changed um, to sort of everything being measured in terms of higher learning outcomes um so seven clinical and seven non-clinical which again i'm not going to list every single one of them um but I'm, I'm just trying to highlight it so that you're aware that the curriculum's changing it might be something might be something that you'll be asked about and it also might be something that you want to look into just to sort of help you figure out whether you know whether it's something you want to get into fine so we're going to get on to the bulk of the talk, um, which is me talking through a day in theatres. So this is the admin building at the RVI, the Royal Victoria Infirmary in Newcastle, which is where I currently work. Um, so we'll start with when I get to work. I thought about including all of this stuff about, you know, my alarm goes off at six and then I snooze it and then I end up getting up at ten past and rushing for the metro and all that stuff. But anyway... On the rotor that I'm currently on, I'm expected to be in 8.30, 8 until 5.30, Monday to Friday. Um, and I'm due to start um, due to start some on-calls in the next few weeks after I finish my IAC, which is something that we'll talk about a little bit more later on. But essentially, in the Northern Deanery, during your first few months as a novice anaesthetist, you are completely supernumerary and you're not put on the on-call rotor. So that's kind of where I'm at at the moment, two months in. So for an eight o'clock start, I usually arrive about 7.45 um, and go along to theatres and collect my theatre list. Um, so essentially what that is, is just a list of patients who are to be operated on in that particular theatre on that day. Um, it includes things like their hospital number, their date of birth, what procedure they're having, any important clinical risks and any um specific requirements um so i do that i get changed then i go and meet the consultant on the ward um so my rota tells me each day which consultant i'm going to be working with um if it's someone i've never met before i kind of just have to hope that i see someone i do recognize and say have you seen b smith um and then they'll point me in the right direction um the idea of meeting the consultant on the ward is that before the day of operating begins we go and assess all of our patients so that we can make appropriate anaesthetic plans for them now for elective patients they'll have already been through a pre-assessment clinic 
um, which is really useful because anybody with um, sort of complex comorbidities and things like that, then they will have had a consultant assessment, which will have helped a figure out whether there's anything that can be optimised in terms of their health um, prior to the operation, but B, would give a clue as to sort of specific difficulties that we might anticipate. So that is really good. But the idea, um, as I say, the idea of the pre of the assessment on the morning um, is trying to assess patient specific risks, um, which might kind of influence the type of anaesthetic you want to give. So examples of that might be um, potentially difficult airway, um, which we'll go into a little bit later on, or if somebody had, um, for example, a respiratory condition like asthma or COPD that might make them more difficult to ventilate, or if somebody had heart failure, um, you know, that, that they would be the sort of things that you would want to know um, and would want to kind of factor into your anaesthetic plan. So once we have been to assess the patients, you know, if there are multiple, then the consultant might go and see some of the patients, the trainee might go and see the other, then you kind of meet back up at the end and say, well, this is what I think, what do you think? And then go to theatre. Um, so these are just a couple of scoring systems that we use to kind of try and assess anaesthetic risk. Um, so the AASA grade, that's American Society of Anesthesiologists. Essentially, it's a score that roughly correlates to sort of degree of morbidity and therefore expected operative risk from a patient point of view. Um, Malin Patty score is just one of the things that we use during an airway assessment. Essentially, it's to assess a patient's mouth opening and therefore, in theory, how likely we think it's going to be that we'll have difficulty trying to intubate and things like that. Now, again, we'll go on to it a little bit later. There can be airway difficulties for other reasons that we don't anticipate. Um, but if, for example, you saw somebody who had a Malin Patty score of four, had really poor mouth opening, and you knew they needed to be intubated, that might be something that you'd consider. You might think, well, actually, let's plan for that. Let's think about using um, different equipment like a video scope or something like that. So um, next thing that we do is go along to the anaesthetic room, um, do some machine checks and meet the anaesthetic assistant, who is either an anaesthetic nurse or an ODP. Um, now, they do the same job, but they have very different training and they don't really like to be confused with each other. So I would suggest if you ever end up, um, you know, w when you end up in training and you end up working with an anaesthetic assistant, just ask them early on whether they're a, um, a nurse or an ODP because it, it matters to them. Um, so one of the things that we have to do every morning is do a machine check. Um, so the anaesthetic machine that we've got here on the right is fairly typical of the ones that I use every day. Um, essentially, there are some AAGBI guidelines on how to perform a machine check. It's something that needs to be done every day, but it's just to make sure that there's not gonna be any problems intraoperatively. So making sure that things like there aren't any leaks in the circuit, like the ventilator's working, like the oxygen and the gas flows are working and all of the monitoring's appropriate. Um, so, once we've done that, we have a chat to the assistant, usually go through what the list is going to be like and what um, our plans would be for each of the patients so that they can start getting them ready. Um, or if there was any special equipment that we might need, then we would let the assistant know at that point. Um, so I suppose anyone who's been in, in an operating theatre, you know, either from the surgical or the anaesthetic point of view, will have done a who briefing in the in the morning where everybody kind of introduces themselves says what their role is um this again is just a chance to discuss the patients once again get the um perspective of the surgical team and see if they have any anticipated difficulties sometimes this is the time when you know we might think about changing the order on the list or think actually you know we need this specific bit of equipment for this patient that we didn't think about before um so very useful and also helps you get to know your team members, which is always helpful when you're kind of moving around every day. Fine, so 8.40, first patient, well, the patient for the day in this case arrives. Um, so I've just included the WHO surgical safety checklist here, which hopefully most of you will have seen before. Um, essentially, when the patient arrives, then we 
go through all of these checks. The assistant does even more checks, asking them about things like allergies, metalware, whether they've been in hospitals outside of the region, all that sort of stuff. We put monitoring on, um, so ECG dots, blood pressure cuff, SATS probe, abyss monitor, which I'll show you in a minute, um, and gain some IV access so we can actually put them to sleep. Um, so the particular patient that I had on this day on, I think last Tuesday it was, that I've decided to talk to you about, was um, a fairly young patient who was having um, a laparotomy um, for a bowel resection. Um, so a young lad Crohn's who was having a bowel resection. So because it was a very large procedure um, and he was going to be in theatre for a long time, he had sort of a higher a higher operative risk. Um, again, this is a chap who was otherwise fit and well, but the surgery itself was very risky. So we had a plan to admit him electively to HDU post-op. Um, because it was a long procedure and because he was going to be admitted to HDU and because there was potential for sort of hemodynamic instability during surgery, um, placed an R line just so that we could have invasive blood pressure monitoring and also so that we could take gases off and things during surgery. Um, so that was something that I did. Um, now, the other diagram that I've drawn there on the other side is of an intrathecal injection. So something that the um, anaesthetic team at the hospital where I work are quite keen on is offering spinal anaesthetic as an adjunct to um, pain relief during for big laparotomy cases. Um, there's evidence showing that it basically helps patients have much better kind of post-op analgesia outcomes. Um, and it also reduces the need to give them um, intraoperative opiates and remifentanil and things like that, um, I believe. Don't quote me on that. So anyway, the next thing that we did was we placed um, a spinal anaesthetic, which was you know, really, really good for me from a sort of procedural point of view to be able to be doing things like this so early on into the anaesthetic training. All of the consultants that I've worked with are really, really helpful, really friendly and very keen to get us involved early on. Um, this is something that, you know, outside of anaesthetics, you're unlikely to be doing um, spinal injections. But, you know, as an ACCS CT1 on acute medicine or, you know, in medicine in general, I guess, you know, LPs are something that you'll be doing quite frequently. And really, it's no different other than, um, you know, introducing the, the medication through the, the fecal syringe at the end. Um, so once we had done all of the preparation, um, it was time to induce anesthesia. So the patient was going to have a TIVA anesthetic, which is total intravenous anesthesia. Um, that is again that's something that is very variable depending on where you work the hospital where i work uses a lot of tiva um so we gave the patient some opiate to begin um and then started a propofol infusion once we were happy that they were asleep we gave some rocuronium to paralyze um which is really important for intubation um so the next thing i did with the consultant kind of in the room was I intubated the patient, um, which is something that, you know, two months ago I wasn't very familiar with, but being in theatres every day and, you know, most days having multiple patients, it's a really, really good chance to kind of get your skills up quite quickly on that side of things. Um, at the end, we'll talk a little bit more about the sort of teaching you get as an anaesthetic trainee. Um, but yeah that's that's something that kind of the consultants are really keen to get you involved in very early on um fine so intubation just gives me um a chance to talk a little bit about um the difficult airway society guidelines um for situations where you're struggling to intubate um, and ventilate this isn't something that you guys need to know about at the minute um, i'm just putting them in so that you're aware of them um and also das do a lot of really useful courses and things if anyone's interested in any of that kind of stuff. Fine, okay, so once the patient is asleep and paralysed and we're happy that all of their parameters are stable, we transfer them into theatre. Now for a big case like a laparotomy or like a free flap or 
anything like that, there will be a lot of faffing around from, you know, the time when you induce anesthesia to them being appropriately positioned and draped and everything, you know, for the surgeons to be ready to start operating. So this monitor on the right is a BIS monitor. Um, essentially what that is, is a machine which uses EEG waveforms to estimate depth of anesthesia. Um, really, really useful in patients having um, intravenous anesthetic. Um, and actually it's, it's now a national guideline, but essentially this number and also the waveform and some of those sort of spectral arrays help us figure out whether we're over or under anesthetizing our patient or whether we've got it just right. Um, fine. So during this kind of period of the scrub mm -hmm. staff getting the patient ready to be operated on, um, the patient dropped their blood pressure. Um, you know, at this point, they were fairly deeply anesthetized. They were, we had given them a bunch of drugs that caused them to um, cause them to vasodilate and there wasn't any surgical stimulus going on. So that's something that's quite common. Um, so when I noticed that, I spoke to the consultant and said, patients just dropped their blood pressure a bit. Should we give some vasopressors? Now, that wasn't because the consultant didn't spot it, but that was because that was the type of teaching that we were doing that day. He was sort of trying to let me notice things and figure out how I wanted to treat them. Um, so patient dropped their blood pressure and we gave some metraminal, which is an alpha-1 agonist, I believe. Um, and once the patient was stabilised um, and the surgeons had started the operation, um, there was actually quite a bit of time for us to just chat. Um, so that sort of episode of the patient dropping their blood pressure prompted quite an extensive discussion on hypotension um, and all of the different things that can cause it. So I've what I've done there is I've copied out um, a slightly neater version of the scribblings that the consultant did during the morning of that case. Um, just more to show you that even aside from all of the procedural stuff that we've already talked about, every day in theatre, there, there is usually an opportunity to learn something, um, sort of in terms of physiology or in terms of pharmacology or whatever you want it to be. So we talked about all of that stuff quite extensively, um, which I really like. I really like that kind of learning style. Um, and actually, it felt quite nice to be able to finally put the first year physiology and pharmacology that was about 10 years back in my brain somewhere um, to good use, which is nice. Um, so another thing, anaesthetists are very, very keen on making sure that everybody is appropriately rested and has um, a good number of breaks throughout the day. Um, so anaesthetic consultants will always say, you know, go get a coffee, go and have a little bit of rest, go and get yourself something to drink, go for a walk, um, which I think in the beginning, I, worried a little bit that they didn't want me to be there um and actually that's not the case at all they're just making sure that you know you're looked after and you're well rested um the reason i've put a picture of a lasagna in here is because one of the consultants i worked with last week said that giving an anesthetic is a lot like making a lasagna and if you ask 10 different people how to do it they'll all give you a different recipe and they'll be convinced that theirs is the best but there's no one right way um so that's that's kind of why i put that there um so afternoon was largely very similar to the morning to be honest um more chance to have a chat um about physiology but just also about you know other things the consultant was telling me that he was hoping that the case finished on time so that he could get his son to his football match and things like that um everyone is really really friendly and it's just a really nice environment to be in and we finished on time which was great um so another analogy um, that a lot of people like to apply to anaesthetics is to say that it's a lot like flying um, with intubation being sort of takeoff. Um, the majority of the time in the procedure being sort of being at cruising altitude and then extubation is the landing. Um, now, that's something that some people underestimate a little bit. Um, you know, they think it's just pulling the tube out. But actually, um, again, I'm not going to sort of go through all the details, but I'm just putting some extubation guidelines from the Difficult Airway Society in here just to make you aware 
that it's an important time to focus at the end of a case. Um, so again, this is something that I did with the consultant kind of beside me, but I was trying to do all of the things myself to anticipate extubation, get the patient ready. So turning up oxygen, getting muscle relaxant reversed, um, doing suction, lightening the anesthesia, things like that. Um, so once the patient was extubated and was awake and was breathing, um, we moved around to recovery, handed over to the, moved him around to recovery, handed over to recovery staff, and then came back to check on him about 15 minutes later just to check that he was okay. Um, and then that was kind of the end of my day. So the um, last thing I'm going to talk about here is the IAC, which is the Initial Assessment of Anesthetic Competence. Um, I realised that I sort of briefly talked about it earlier on. Essentially, this is the certificate that you get at the end of sort of your first three to six months of practice, which says this doctor is competent to work on their own um, for some simple cases. Um, now, in practice, it doesn't mean that you're going to be left on your own all the time at three months. Definitely not. But... The reason I'm putting this in here is just to highlight how much learning you can do in such a short period of time um, and how steep a learning curve it is over the first few months. Um, I saw this a few months ago um, and thought it looked really intimidating, but actually two months in, I feel like it's achievable. So that's, I suppose, quite a positive thing from a teaching point of view. Um, the other thing that we get um, as trainees in the Northern Deanery, which I think is probably the case in other deaneries, but I can't sort of say for certain, um, is that we get regular SIM-based teaching in the form of the new starter course. So that is six full day sessions over the first two months, at least in, in, in my region, that's what we get, um, where we're taught kind of basics of anaesthesia. So um inducing anaesthesia in a patient, dealing with common comorbidities, dealing with difficult airways, um, critical incidents, things like that, um, which again sounds scary, but it's really, really good fun and massively valuable learning experience. Um, so I realise that's been a bit of a whistle-stop tour, um, but that's kind of all that I wanted to cover. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions if anybody has them. I've got some resources there. So if anyone has any questions, just pop them in the chat function. Um, and because I, I think I, you guys can speak on here um, and we can just read them out and discuss them. But otherwise, I think that was that was great. It was very informative. Um, what's your favourite thing about about being an ACCS trainee? Um, I suppose in terms of ACCS versus um, or anaesthetics, do you mean, or do you mean just no, in just general? in general, just in general? Um, I think I think. I'm the sort of person who kind of likes to understand everything that I'm doing um, in a lot of detail. And for me, although I felt like, you know, the CT1 year was tough in terms of rotor and in terms of curriculum requirements and portfolio and all that stuff, having just more experience of unwell patients, resource scenarios and things in ED is something that is really helpful. And it's actually in a strange way, made me feel more prepared for those kind of things happening in theatre. Loads of completely different environment. You know, if I'm used to dealing with a hypoxic patient or I'm used to dealing with a hypotensive patient or whatever for me, then I feel like a lot of those skills are transferable. Um, at the moment, from a CT2 point of view, it's completely different to CT1. So in the Northern Deanery, we do... Um, ED and acute med in first year and then anaesthetics and ITU in second year. Um, so this is completely different in that I kind of spent the last four years doing versions of similar jobs, um, you know, kind of ward jobs, A&E, medicine, surgery, bit of peds, um, jobs that I vaguely knew, you know, I, I had an idea how to do and now I've just come into something completely new where 
I've not got any experience of it before, but actually nothing's expected of me. But the teaching quality is just really, really great. Um, and actually speaking to friends in other specialties, they haven't, uh, you know, I'm sure the specialties do have really great teaching at various points, but none of them have quite that kind of apprenticeship style of learning that that you do as an anaesthetic new starter and I think that's something that I'm really enjoying at the moment. Um, so I've got a question from Jennifer in the chat which says which F2 rotations do you recommend for ACCS? Um, I think I can only really tell you about my experience. What I did was GP, PEDS and A&E. Um, the reason that I did those was because I thought it would give me fairly broad base of training. Um, I think trying to get specialties that have a degree of acuity is helpful if you can but i also know trainees who didn't do those kind of specialties um you know people who've only done things like gynae and psychiatry and stuff like that um and they don't struggle you know i think probably having done a and e before as an f2 and especially an extra year as an f3 I probably found the step up to CT1 a little bit less intense than some people who've never done it before. Um, but by the end of that period, everyone kind of ends up okay. Um, so I suppose my advice would be if you can get things like a &E, um, or ITU, then that's great. If you can't, don't worry about it because it's not going to be the thing that means you do or don't get a training number or if you do, that you do or don't struggle. Um, question from Oliver, how concerned are trainees about the registrar bottleneck? Um, <laughs> to be honest, I, I am a little bit concerned about it, um, but I think that's possibly says a little bit more about me as a person than it does about the, um, about the kind of situation in general. What I've been told by um, some of my consultant colleagues is that the college are trying to do things at the moment to shift the training numbers a little bit, at least temporarily, to try and get more people through. Um, I think the other thing to bear in mind is, yes, there's a bottleneck, but training at the beginning is also competitive. So, if, you know, if you're capable of getting in once, you're capable of getting in again. Um, and just because there is a competition ratio doesn't mean that you won't get um a reg training number. Um, I suppose the only thing that's kind of making me do that I otherwise wouldn't is be a little bit more on the ball about things like QI and audit and all of that sort of stuff a little bit earlier on. Um, but again, by early on, I mean now CT2 for me, I do not mean at your stage. So don't worry about an ST4 bottleneck at the moment. Um, okay, so got a question from Nahid, why did I choose ACCS anaesthetics training instead of core? Um, uh, so a few things, so firstly the region that I'm in, um, that I wanted to stay in, mainly does ACCS anaesthetics training. Um, one of the other things though that I was thinking was at the time when I was applying, I actually wasn't sure whether I wanted to do anaesthetics or whether I wanted to do a and &E. I'd done a lot of a and &E, I really enjoyed it, um, I have to say I, I don't have those doubts anymore. Um, I really, really enjoy anaesthetics and I think it's the right thing for me to do. Um, but, you know, at the time I thought, well, ACCS, if I do ACCS, I, it would be easier to transfer the other way if, if I decided I didn't like anaesthetics. Um, another thing that some people think about is if you want to do ITU in the future, at some point you need to do six months as a medical SHO. If you do ACCS training, then it's done. If you don't, then you can still do ITU. You just need to go back and do your medicine later on. Um, so just all things like that, really. Um, again, I think also the time that you spend in your CT one year does get you points at SD4 application at the moment in terms of time spent in the complementary specialty. Um, and I'm kind of of the belief that more experience and time spent probably would have made me better um, that's absolutely not to say that going straight into core from F2 or anything like that is a bad thing. I just prefer to kind of take a little bit more time. Um, so I th hopefully that answers your question, Nahid. Yeah. Any other questions? 
It doesn't look like there's any more questions on the chat. Okay. Um, what I will do, um, I, I'm happy to, if anybody does have any questions, I'm happy for you to get in touch with the Mind the Bleak team and they can forward them on to me or I can, well, I can put my email address in the chat now. Um, the only reason I'm doing that rather than putting it on the, um, rather than on the kind of presentation is I don't know how long the presentation is going to be up for and the idea of my email address being on there forever for anyone to just indefinitely ask me questions doesn't seem great but I'm happy to answer questions for a finite group of people um, so I've put that in the chat now and if anyone does have any further questions that you maybe didn't want to ask on the chat or anything that you think of later on then just just send me an email Great. Uh, well, thank you very much for your time. Um, guys, please do fill out the feedback form um, and then we can get you guys sent over some attendance certificates. Um, and again, as Olivia said, if you have any questions, email her, email us. Um, and let us know if there's any other things in particular you want. I think we've got a series of webinars coming up. Um, but if there's anything in particular you guys want to see, drop us an email um, and we can see if we can get it done. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for your time. No worries. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.